Uh, you probably remember Jonas. Jonas has uh, graduated from ENSC in 2020, uh, Ecotech concentration, um, and now he is a master's student in the University District of Columbia. He's in the Department of Civil Engineering, and it's in the concentration of environmental engineering and water resources. He worked a couple of uh, places before uh, joining the uh, graduate school. He went to Montgomery County and doing some water sampling and stuff like that. And also he was he worked in um, doing some aquatic vegetation evaluation uh, somewhere else in, in, in Maryland as well. In his free time, he likes to play volleyball. Can you believe that? He also likes to listen to music, hiking. I know he likes cats as well. The reason he's gonna, I'm introducing is because uh, he's been doing his research in the aquaponics lab. Uh, Jonas, welcome to Great, thank you. Um, yeah, hi everyone, my name's Jonas again. Um, and my thesis research is on aquaponics with scavenging materials to support life off of Earth. Um, this is NASA funded research that we're doing to try and optimize aquaponic systems in order to hopefully help astronauts and people doing research um, up in orbit uh, to better use aquaponic systems. There we go. Okay. Um, so just some background on why we're doing this research overall, uh, we are, it's because space travel and also, you know, research in space continues to grow in length and scope. More people want to do more research in space for longer periods of time and go out longer. And there's also a small group of people who want to live on the moon and, and crazy stuff like that. Uh, but a huge limiting factor for any of that is food. Uh, you can only store so much food onto spacecraft because <laughs> Um, most of the time, you know, this is how it was stored on spacecraft in the. Okay, sorry, I just want to hide it. Um, it's you know, this is how they've been storing food on spacecraft since you know forever. They put it in tin cans, they put it in plastic bags, and it takes up not only a lot of space on board, but it also weighs a lot. And those are two things that are really important for them to think about before sending up things up to do research, because you only have so much room on these things, and even the smallest kind of weight difference or height difference or anything could cause issues for liftoff or anything going up on there. So there's a lot of there's a lot of problems surrounding food that they haven't really been able to address because they haven't been able to figure it out. And that's why we're looking to bioregenerative food sources such as aquaponics uh, in order to help us with these problems. Um, and just so this is one um, hydroponic solution that they're looking into uh, where they it's called the veggie and they uh, basically have a plant pillow here and they have nutrients and water within a pillow and it just has a little tiny hole where the plant grows out of. So that's one solution that they've been looking into, but that's only aquaponic, uh, sorry, hydroponic. It's only half what we're looking into today. Um, so just some background for everyone. So uh, we're all on the same page for aquaponics. What it is, it's the summation of hydroponics, which is growing plants without soil. Uh, for instance, if you have, or have ever seen plants being grown in PVC pipes or something like that, uh, they'll just have plants in a small little media. A lot of the time it's in something called rock wool, where it's just enough to just hold the roots in place. And then water filled with nutrients will flow through the system and be able to give the plants what they need while keeping things light and portable. Uh, it's the summation of that and aquaculture, which is fish farming, uh, just growing fish for food. They do that all over the country, but with aquaponics, it's generally a lot more small scale. How these systems work is, um, I'll just walk over here. We have uh, step one where we just have fish tanks um, where we put the fish in there and they feed them. And of course the fish, uh, they, have, uh, they be in poop and it gets transferred and it gets pumped into our plant beds. Uh, what we do a little differently from this diagram in our aquaponic systems in Dr. Zersch's lab is before going into the plant beds, it goes through a biofilter, as I took a picture of here. Um, there, the fish pee and poop and anything that we don't want to go back into the system gets filtered out through these systems of sponges. And then it goes through a few different types of plastic and ceramic media where nitrifying bacteria are able to propagate and you know, grow in, in form of biofilm so that we can transform the ammonia from the fish into nit uh, nitrites and then nitrates for the plants to eat up. Um, and so once those um, bacteria have, have made that happen, it, it then goes to the plants and then gets pumped back to the fish and it forms a nice little ecosystem where everything is being used. Um, 
the plan for my research is using scavenging materials within those biofilters to help the aquaponic systems be more efficient, be easier to handle. Um, we're looking into materials that can absorb ammonia and other kinds of contaminants, such as uh, VOCs in the atmosphere, possibly, and also human health contaminants in the water, such as um, nickel, silver. Um, we are looking at magnesium, too. Uh, and the materials that we've chosen are kind of a range. We have zeolite. Um, zeolite and arcelite are very similar. They're kind of clay-like substances. They're very porous. Um, and zeolite's been used in aquaponics before. Arcelite is, is new. We, that hasn't really been used before. Um, we're using granular activated carbon, kind of a good choice just because of how porous it is. And it's used in a lot of wastewater uh, treatment systems. So it's a good, a good way to look at this, uh, to add it to the system, see how it interacts. Uh, we're looking at Kedosan as well, which has been used in similar applications, silica gel, and then we're looking into aerogel as well. Um, NASA wanted us to look into that a bit because it's a kind of a new substance that not a lot of people have done research with, especially on this. So we were trying to look into that as well. Um, but the plan for the research is that these scavengers will trap the ammonia and you know, other things in the system as it passes through the biofilter, and then the bacteria will be able to better nitrify and, and keep the ammonia out of the system. Um, so just overall, uh, before we go, uh, enable, we're just trying to enable longer duration space flight and also longer duration research within space by enhancing the efficiency of those bioregenerative systems, promoting the nitrification within them, reducing levels of harmful water contaminants, and providing more nutritious food to astronauts. Um, and here are the systems that we're doing our research on right now in Dr. Azursa's lab, um, as I was saying earlier. The fish tanks are back here that gets pumped up into these biofilters. They're covered so that um, no algae grows within them. And then after nitrifying, the water goes back down into the plant beds. We have a uh, raft-based systems instead of uh, media-based systems. So uh, as the water levels rise and fall, the rafts will just stay right on top, ensuring that the plants always have water. And then it goes back down to the fish tanks. And Overall, the list of experiments that uh, we have done and will be doing are uh, a lot of adsorption batch experiments where we're looking into just by themselves how the different materials can absorb uh, ammonium, magnesium, silver, and nickel um, in, in different concentrations and seeing what the best concentrations or pH or any, any sorts of uh, parameters are best for that. And then we're also looking into aqua, full aquaponics experiment where we're gonna be monitoring plant health data and biomass, uh, fish health data, such as length, weight, um, any checking if anything's wrong with them. Uh, we're looking into ammonia nitrate and nitrate concentrations weekly, a bunch of the other uh, water quality data. And we'll also be doing microbial samples to try and see how the materials that write into the system affect the uh, bacterial communities within the, the biofilters. Uh, so first off, we just, uh, at the beginning of my research, started off with some very basic uh, ammonia adsorption batch experiments. And this is for three of the scavengers. We have zeolite on the left, uh, activated carbon in the middle, and arcelite here. And they had surprisingly low adsorption capacities. I have them calculated here, 0.37 milligrams per gram for zeolite, 00053 for um, GAC, and then just 0.1 for arcelite. Um, and I was pretty surprised by how poorly all of them did in batch. Um, of course, it's possible that they could have done better within an active system, but we still wanted to look into it more and understand why nothing was happening. Um, especially since when we were looking into uh, previous research, people were able to uh, get, uh, for instance, zeolite and activated carbon up to um, like uh, adsorption capacities of 17 milligrams per gram. So things weren't really adding up. Um, this is the other, the, the rest of our scavengers. We have Kedosan, silica gel, and aerogel, and we had similarly frustrating results at first. Uh, the number for Kedosan is negative, but it, it was just zero. Um, the data got confused by that. but. We had zero for kaidosan, 0.1 milligram per gram for silica gel, and 0.02 for aerogel. Um, so still nothing was making sense for a while because it, it wasn't adding up with what we had read in, in previous research. And we know that some of these materials are very porous and they should be able to grab onto things, but something wasn't clicking. Um, so in order to look into that more, we start, decided to look into material characteristics. Um, I had never really done material science before, but I started having to dip my toes into it to better understand this. So we started looking into adsorption isotherms and material characteristics of all of the materials. 
Uh, so I started off doing an adsorption isotherm for just uh, zeolite. And so what we were looking at is uh, we plotted it with, we kept the, con the amount of zeolite the same in our batch experiments, but varied our concentrations of ammonia so that we were able to get adsorption capacities versus equilibrium concentrations of each of those. Um, and once we plot that, we can use uh, a Freundlich isotherm model to better understand what's happening on the surface of these uh, scavengers. Um, I won't get too much into the math of it, but basically the uh, what's most important is uh, it gives us this linearized form right here, and it gives us an NF value and a KF value. Um, and the NF value is able to show us how much adsorption is happening. If it's below one, that's a good thing. The lower it can get, the more adsorption is possible. And with KF value, it's a marker for how much activity is happening on the surface of each of the scavengers. So higher is better for that value. Um, for zeolite, we had an NF value of 0.8, which was pretty good. It's below one. It shows that it was absorbing, and that matches with our previous results. And the KF value at 100 does show that there was activity going on. So, you know, the reason why it was absorbing, it, it's very porous, and that helps. But it's because of the certain functional groups on the surface of the zeolite that were mostly helping. Um, we continue to look into other scavengers uh, in the same kind of method. For silica gel, we had an NF value. It was still close enough to one, but it's over, so showing it's not as uh, well as an adsorbent, and a very low KF value showing that, you know, for silica gel, it was working, but not because of the functional group. So we have to kind of figure out with each scavenger what will work the best. Um, for more, we have arcelite. Um, here, the NF value under one, so that's good. It's a good adsorbent. KF value uh, was higher than others, so it's still showing that there is activity on the surface and. This makes sense because it's a clay just like zeolite. Um, but for this one, we had a pretty weak R squared value, which was confusing since it was absorbing, but the absorption value was, I think what, what's going on with this is these, um, the arcelite didn't absorb, it's still absorbed, but not as much as the zeolite. And what we think is that it's not fitting this model as well as, as others. There are other absorption models that we've been testing. Um, there's Langmuir that I tried out and it, it was worse, but the, the, <laughs> the fact is that there, there's a lot other models that it can fit based on the type of adsorption that's happening. And the more that we learn about the materials, the more we can get it to better fit these. Um, but it still does show that basically there's weak adsorption happening here. And it's because the surface isn't necessarily right for the adsorption of ammonia. Um, we also have activated carbon, which was the, the saddest one. Um, because you would think it would work, but it, it, it's really awful. Um, we have an NF value of 11, and um, our KF value is really, really close to zero. And our R squared value is 0.1 because there's so little absorption that it doesn't want to fit the model at all. Um, so we were very confused by this, but continue to go on trying to learn more about these to see why activated carbon isn't working at all. Um, we also on the side are looking into adsorption of other materials, as I said before. So for here, we just did a similar adsorption isotherm for magnesium with zeolite. Um, it wasn't as good. We had an NF value of 1.5 and KF value of 16. So it shows, you know, zeolite is selective on what it does take up. Um, after some basic research, I, I was, I found that um, there's selectivity coefficients for zeolite and ammonium is pretty high up, which makes sense for what we've seen so far, but magnesium's all the way down here. Um, it, it selects it way less than any other cation. So we're looking into modifying the surface to see if we can get it better for both, hopefully. Um, and then uh, finally, last adsorption isotherm for a while um, is silica gel with magnesium. Um, it, it, makes sense with the model it's got a high r squared value but still there's not a lot of absorption going on so again just like all the others we need to learn more we need to characterize these better and, and alter them so that they can work better in our systems for everything at once um so just overall results from all the graphs that i just threw at you is that um, zeolite is the best by a lot so far for adsorbents followed up by arcelite and silica gel and the others um, performing way, way less uh, than we expected them to. So um, we're trying to treat the adsorbents uh, that, you know, we went into the phase of our research where we decided we were going to treat them. And so that to help alter the surface chemistry to better suit it for proper selection for these uh, contaminants. Uh, after doing some preliminary research, I 
came up with some methods for treatments for each of them. Unfortunately, Arcelite has no data because no one's ever used it uh, this, in that way before. And you can't treat aerogel. So we kind of just knocked it off the list there. We're not sure what to do with aerogel, but for the rest of them, um, silica gel, we can incorporate metal ionic liquids, uh, very tricky. Um, Kadosan, they coagulate it into beads of using bentonite, which is a seems like a pretty promising method. For GAC, um, you can treat it with pure ammonia or hydrogen peroxide, but we looked into hydrogen peroxide. Uh, and then for zeolite, you can use uh, sodium chloride at a high, at high concentration to change the function of groups there to get it to absorb better. Um, but anyway, we continued to, after doing that research, characterize all the materials, and we decided on three different methods. Uh, we used BET analysis, uh, Brunauer, Emmett, Teller, uh, which basically helps us to determine the surface area and porosity of each of them. Uh, we have a, a proximeter in the fab lab here, so I got access to there and have been working in there to uh, figure everything out that way. We're also going to do bone titration to help figure out the functional groups on each of them as they are uh, untreated, and then point of zero charge tests on them so we can determine um, the pH at which the net charge on the surface of each of them is zero, so we can find a correct pH to alter the charges on the surface. Um, but after that, we'll be able to uh, pre-treat them as we see fit, and then hopefully we'll be able to see much better values. Um, for the BET analysis in the Fab Lab, um, we had to um, basically degas our materials for five to eight hours, generally on the longer side, and then uh, place it in liquid nitrogen and uh, we were able to analyze it with that machine uh, with absorption and desorption of the nitrogen gas. Uh, we've gotten good data for zeolite and activated carbon so far, and we've been able to figure out their single point surface area, BET surface area, and average pore size was interesting to me because um, the GAC has much larger pores than the zeolite, but still wasn't doing anything. So we know it, it doesn't come down to the pores. Um, as we get data on more of these, I'm curious to see what the others will look like. And, I think it'll give us a better picture of why things are happening the way they are. Um, we also started doing point of zero charge tests, and this one was really important for us because for aquaponic systems, you need to keep the pH between six and seven. Um, plants like it lower, fish like it higher, so it's kind of a good middle ground for both of them, but if we have it too low or too high one way, the fish or the plants are going to end up struggling. Um, these are just two uh, data sets for point of zero charge. We have the change of pH over the initial pH. And um, whenever it crosses the uh, X axis is the point of zero charge. And so for Arcelite untreated, it's at, uh, it was at 7.25. And for silica gel, it was really low. It was at about 2.25. Um, so it's interesting data because we know that, you know, for instance, for Ar for Arcelite, if we wanted it to be negatively charged um, so it could take positive uh, ammonium cations, uh, we would need the pH to be up here so that it could be negatively charged, um, which is good because now we know for Arcelite, we want a pretreatment that lowers the point of zero charge so we can get those proper cations. Um, we did another test with activated carbon, trying to make it work. Hopefully, um, we had a point of zero charge for normal activated carbon and our point of zero charge there was at seven and after we treated it with hydrogen peroxide we got a point of zero charge of six so it lowered it a whole ph scale so which makes it pretty optimal for aquaponic systems because it gives us now any ph over six it'll be able to select those cations um, we also did a point of zero charge test for our zeolite and our sodium treated zeolite and it didn't bring the the point of zero charge down as much. It was at about 7.2 uh, for untreated, and then it went down to 6.8 for treated, uh, but it still gives us a better range for adsorption within aquaponic systems. After learning this, we decided to do a treatment test, uh, a basic treatment test with the regular zeolite and the uh, treated zeolite, just because it's our, our front runner, our best adsorbent. We wanted to see at least if one would work. Um, so here I had um, two different concentrations of uh, ammonia. We had it at around 20 and around 2.5, and we compared results between sodium zeolite and zeolite. Um, regular zeolite gave us percentage removals of 66 to 76 untreated, and treated with the sodium, we were able to get percentage removal of 80 to 96 percent. So that kind of proved to us right there that the, the most important thing that we're looking for is changing the functional groups. 
uh, for this pretreatment, and it's pretty simple too. All we had to do was um, leave it in a 20 gram per liter um, so sodium chloride solution for 24 hours, decant, refill, another 24 hours, and then it's ready. So uh, pretreatment for this isn't particularly difficult, but it increases the uh, absorption capacity by a lot. So it could be a good method for using this in aquaponic systems in the future. Um, because that went so well, we also did an isotherm for the sodium treated zeolite um, and the results were pretty interesting. Um, I know I don't have the information from the previous one on here, but I, I have it remembered. Um, the R squared value for the previous one was, it was still 0.9, but it was 0.91. So this one is 0.987. So it's actually a lot closer to a true fit on the model. Uh, the NF value um, on the untreated zeolite was 0.8 and this one was 0.91. But since the model is closer, uh, a better fit, it probably means that it's about the same uh, NF value wise, but the KF value grew, showing that, you know, before it was at about 100 to 110, somewhere there. And so the activity on the surface is now higher, and that supports why the absorption is higher. Um, but moving on from that, we have our full aquaponic systems experiment. Now that we had one uh, scavenger properly working treated versus untreated, we decided to put it to test in the aquaponic systems along with one of our others. So this is a test that I'm actually doing right now in Dr. Zerser's lab. I've been here all week, um, but we're doing control systems, um, three systems control, three zeolite, three silica gel, and then three of that sodium treated zeolite that works better. Um, and we're just trying to see how well they'll be able to absorb the ammonia and nitrify within the systems. Um, and so we're going to be testing the ammonia absorption, nitrification capacity. Um, we'll also be monitoring microbial populations, plant growth, fish health, and then all the other water quality parameters just to see how they affect these systems. Before we started the experiment, we got some baseline data from our systems. Um, we were growing some Ethiopian kale as shown right over there. Um, and that's one of the plants that NASA recommended and we got uh, we decided to take it from three separate points in the systems um, in the biofilter um, as the water is going into the plant bed and as the water is going into the fish tank and we got a somewhat interesting spread there wasn't as much variation between the three points as we figured there would be but there is a slightly higher concentration of nitrate coming out of the biofilter which makes sense after it's gone through the transformations with the bacteria uh, but what was a little surprising is that the ammonia concentration stayed the same, which means the systems could be optimized. Um, so we decided to continue with the experiment. And so I'm just going to go through with all the data that we've been taking. Um, we do our fish health measurements. We're, we're getting the data right now, so I don't have anything to show you. But we are getting our fish health measurements. We take them out, weigh them, uh, get their length, um, and record it on a uh, three times during the experiment. We'll do it at the beginning, the middle, the end to make sure all of them are doing well. Um, and we're adding our treatment in uh, 0.45 micron filter bags. Uh, I added a fourth layer to the biofilters before I only talked about the sponge and these, but I uh, we got a new layer added to each of them and um, we got them in the filter bags so that it stays separate from the rest of the population and the fish within the system while still allowing water to flow on top of them and form a bio layer. Um, we're also taking light temperature and plant health measurements on a, on a weekly basis. Um, we're constantly measuring them for height uh, and plant cover and we'll also be using a spag meter on them for uh, when the leaves grow large enough and we'll also we're also monitoring um, the light intensity and temperature at the at the plant bed for each of them. And then finally, we're doing uh, nutrient testing on a weekly basis, again, at those three points, uh, just like our baseline. Um, and we're taking measurements for ammonia, nitrate, and nitrite, and so far, seeing how they affect the systems. Um, and so we're going to be doing that over a four-week period. We're on week two right now. Uh, for the microbio side of the experiment, we are testing microbial populations using the spiral plating method, which I'll get into a little bit later. But first, we used the most probable number method um, to determine baseline amounts of microbes in our systems before we started the experiment. Um, we plated serial diluted columns of water samples to calculate the number of microbes from the number of spots in each plate. And I'll show you examples of that right here. But that stuff, 
on the left is our batch test that we did where we just kept it in jars instead of from the aquaponic systems. And each of the jars had those same treatments that I are being tested on our system. And we're gonna see how they affect, we saw how they affected the water in the results here. So this is what our plates look like. Um, I'll explain how it works, but basically we took the water samples from it and did a serial dilution uh, in each of these columns where it got by, uh, by 10, it got diluted more and more each time. And then after um, a certain period of time, we would take it and then plate these and let bacterial colonies grow in it. And by doing that, um, we, they have this online calculator for it where you can put in all your specific data, how you did it, and it's able to give you a 95% accurate result on basically the populations of microbes within your systems. Uh, for instance, this one, our a grow bed in plant tank 10, uh, we were able to see that we had 7,600 um, microbes per gram. And then here's two other plates that we had, fish tank 7 and fish tank 10, just for example. Um, it was very varied. We had 5,800 in fish tank 7. Meanwhile, in fish tank 10, we had 21,000. Um, so it, it's very variables from system to system, but that's going to be interesting to look at how the different treatments affect all of these. Um, so also another thing with this method that we did is it helped us to find out the dilutions we needed. Um, we did have some uh, troubles with dilutions in the beginning. For instance, uh, for this to work, you need to have your last row. Uh, basically, we, we count each full row of spots. Um, so for instance, on this one, it was getting really close to not having a full empty row in here. It was, uh, we counted it on like three full rows and it had four spots, one spot and zero. But if it has a spot on there, that means that it's not been diluted enough. And so that helped us to reach our proper dilutions for the spiral plating method. Um, for our full experiment, uh, we did reset the tanks. We cleaned them of excess algae and um, dirt before starting the experiment, which did take the populations down. Instead of getting in the thousands, we're now getting um, levels uh, from like 10 to 130, but we're seeing that they're steadily regrowing. Uh, but with this method, uh, we take the water samples and we're partnered with USDA right now with Dr. Pat Milner. And I give the samples to her and we take them to USDA and put them in a spiral plating machine. And it works in a similar way where it's able to um, plant the, put the colonies on these spiral plates. And then by counting the amount of colonies on there, we can still estimate how many there are. So for now we're getting 10 to 130, but um, we're taking data again on Monday and we expect to see it raise um, over these next four weeks. And we'll be able to see how each treatment affects that. Um, and finally, uh, just at the end of the experiment, once all the data has been taken, uh, we're gonna use Minicule Plus, uh, which is modeling software for uh, chemical experiments to see how each of the components will react. Um, since some of the experiments that we're doing, um, you know, it, it's NASA research, it's more related to space. It's hard to see how certain things will react so we'll use this to kind of broaden what we understand with the data and just make sure anything that we can't do in lab, we'll still be able to test it here. Um, but yeah, that's on my research so far. Um, thanks to everyone who's helped me so far and all my funding agencies, especially um, NASA, all the help I get here at University of Maryland, um, UDC and USDA. Um, but thank you all for listening. Um, and if you have any questions, I can take them. We do have plenty of time for questions, and I have one or two, okay. so I'll jump yeah. in. I'll take, take the liberty myself. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of emphasis on zeolites, right? yeah. but, but zeolite you're probably aware is a pretty general group of minerals. Right? Yeah. There's like 50 or 60 different zeolites. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, first question is, do you know what zeolites you're actually working with? We're using clinoptil. I, I, I always, kilolite. yeah, okay, that's a pretty common one. Yeah, okay. it's, it's one of the most common. Yeah, yeah. so okay. that, that's what we're using. Okay. And then the thing I noticed is that your, your zeolite that in your bags and batches is pretty, it's like small gravel, mm -hmm. right? So are there, even though we know the mineral itself has got this open porous structure, mm -hmm. uh, if the, are there physical issues that potentially could be involved here? I mean, if you had smaller grain sizes of the zeolite, would you be able to, would the, to be able to act, uh, effectively access, you know, more of the interior porosity or is, 
Is it sufficiently open and wide like a big screen that even if it's gravel size, you're sure that, you know, that, you, that the water's moving through, that you're getting adequate interaction between the interiors? Mm -hmm. I mean, th that's a really good point. I think when it's smaller, if, if we were to crush it and make it even smaller, I feel like we would see at least higher absorption, at least like higher, when we're working with the porosity, we'd be able to see more surface area that way. So I think it possibly could make absorption higher. I'd be interested to try it, but that that's that's how we have it right now, but I'd be happy to try making it smaller. Wouldn't be too hard. So yes, yeah, so you looked at changes in concentration. I'm wondering if there's any, is there any water loss from that, the system? Because it, like what I'm saying is like if you had mass loading or would that affect the concentration change at all or change in the mass the removal? Um, Plants might be transpiring and taking water out so you get a lower concentration, but there's less water. Right. Um, I, I'm honestly not really sure because we, we haven't been measuring water losses from the systems. It's kind of tricky to do it with our systems just because we, we, we have to constantly take water samples out of it to even test it. So I guess we can quantify how much we lose from there, but it's, it's hard to directly measure how much water we have in the systems. Well, what I'm saying, maybe you could measure the volume of water flowing in out as a flow meter. Okay. Yeah. Flowing out. And so let's say you start out with 10 milliliters per hour or something, and then they're 10 milliliters and then eight come out. Mm -hmm. It means, you know, you, there's 20% less volume of water. Mm -hmm. you know, so the concentration could even be exactly the same, but it would be yeah, like lower, less yeah. total amount that yeah, was removed. Right. So it's something like a wastewater treatment well. So mm -hmm. different answers. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's really interesting. I'm happy to look into that. And then I, I wasn't familiar with the SPAD meter and mm -hmm. I looked it up. It's like for chlorophyll. Yeah. It measures chlorophyll in the leaves. So how are you going to interpret that or what do you think you're going to do with that? I mean, what we were thinking was just uh, measuring the chlorophyll within the leaves would kind of give us a good indicator of how healthy the leaves are themselves because when we're just looking at them we can be like oh this plant is greener than this one but i think it would give us a better metric at, at how healthy they are just based off of those levels so you're looking at, at greenness as like a measure of plant health or it's like nitrogen content yeah right? yeah basically like that So one, so I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, going back to the minerals um, or the different substrates that you use for absorption, um, did you consider to use like a, like a common like two to one clay, like expandable clay, like vermiculite or mm. montmorillonite or something like that? I, I looked into montmorillonite a little bit. I I wasn't sure. I, I I picked these ones because I saw them used in like similar use cases a lot more. But mm -hmm. I don't know. I feel like it'd be interesting to look into that that one specifically because I, I I was considering it just because of its properties. But yes, but because I was thinking like it that that's really the restrictive thing, right? Because I kept thinking I was like, if you lower the pH, you get the right surface charge that you need to make things stick. Yeah, or maybe it was going off. I forget. But um, oh, that's right. Uh, but yeah, you know, like one of those clays that has like a permanent negative charge would yeah. be pretty much what you're looking for. Yeah, that's a good idea, actually. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> There's a question that came in online uh, from Dr. Shermahamadi. Mm -hmm. He was wondering if, is it possible that the absorption rate could vary with time for each scavenger? So in other words, could the values of NF and KF vary with time? That'd be kind of a dynamic component. Mm -hmm. Is that feasible? Yeah, so we were looking at that because we didn't want to make our absorb when we're doing them in batch. At first, I was only doing it for like eight hours because I figured it would get most of the absorption done since it was such a small quantity of ammonia that we were testing in the beginning. Um, but I decided to increase those. They were actually 48 hour batch experiments because I wanted to let it really rest and get to equilibrium. So I the data that we have right now is based off of them reaching the equilibrium state. So I, I gave it 48 hours and by then all of them had reached that state. But I, I guess the question is more of how could it relate during the time frame? I, I don't know. That's, that's kind of interesting. I, I don't, I'm not sure how I would look into that. Um, 
but I'd, I'd be happy to talk about it. Um, I forgot who asked the question, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, my, did me. I may I make a comment. Uh -huh. The, the chitosan is that is that a derivative of chitin? Yeah, it's so it's the reason why we picked it was because uh, originally back when we made the proposal, we wanted to use shrimp. Uh, we thought it'd be interesting uh, for shrimp to be used in the research instead of goldfish. Um, the way fell, things fell through, we ended up using goldfish. But it'd be I thought it would be interesting if you know the people on the moon or whatever. Um, had shrimp in their aquaponic systems, you know, they eat the shrimp use and then the they, shell, they use right? the shells yeah. to make more of kaidosan. Yeah. Hopefully it could be even more of a, you know, closed loop system, uh, but that that's that's why I was using it, but it's it's not working too well for <laughs> absorption, unfortunately. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you use silicon gel, silicon gel in the lab experiment mm -hmm. was that one of the ones that didn't have as much a reactive response or um it it was absorbing some but not as much as i wanted but it, it did work so that we're using it in our aquaponic systems right now because it was one of the three that like actually worked oh, okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. so i you know when i was next door i go in there and uh, it's a cool lighting and stuff um, <laughs> is that so the plants just get like red and blue light or is that a special grow bulb um it's i i looked into it because i was interested too they've tried a bunch of different colors of lighting that work best for plants and the combination of red and blue works the best they the yeah well exactly but they were having some issues i saw uh, there was actually NASA research where, you know, they're using the red and the blue lights, but then they couldn't tell if the plants were sick because of the, they all just look pink. Um, so they had the red and the blue lights and they added a green one to try and make it so that they could see what they actually look like. And I think it worked out well, but we don't have the green ones here. <laughs> so, it's great for uh, photographs. Yeah, it it looks really advanced. cool. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I agree. The pizzazz factor is high. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I have a question about, um, since we're talking about the lights, I guess I can ask about like, the actual food that you're growing. So you said like, some kind of kale? Yeah, so, so we're trying two. Uh, we tried, it's called Ethiopian kale right now. Mm -hmm. It's also called Amara mustard. I don't know the actual scientific name, but it seems like they can't decide if it's a kale or a mustard. But we also do outrageous lettuce. They're both ones that NASA wants us to use because they've grown it in ISS before. So. Those are, that's why we picked, we, we, we stuck with those two. Okay, that's, so that's like why you chose those. Yeah, they it, it's, well. they've worked up there before, so okay. we're gonna not get too crazy. That that was the plan. Um, I just have to ask this question, but can fish survive in space? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> they, they can. They've actually done research on the best ways to get them up there. I think one I saw where they were using fingerlings and they, had the fingerlings while they transported up there because some of them, I think if you transport adult fish up there, they have weird responses to the microgravity. Um, but I, it, like more, way more research needs to be put into this. Uh, not a lot of people are really sure. It's all kind of guessing and figuring it out. Um, but yeah, that, it's an interesting point. It's um, a really good question because you think about when, like in the space shuttle, the water goes everywhere, right? Yeah. <laughs> like peeing in a vacuum. Yeah, I mean, originally I wanted my research, I think I was getting too excited. I wanted to try and see how we could also keep it closed loop and keep the water in there and not have to deal with it. But I, I, no, not I unfortunately <laughs> not. Um, yeah. Um, you could do your experiments in those planes that like fly. In the yeah. I, as long as I'm not up there, that <laughs> we could, we could do that. Um, and just, um, so we're talking about the fish and maybe I just missed it, but mm -hmm. was there a reason why um, I mean, goldfish are just really hardy. They're kind of good for research because a lot, a lot of other fish are super susceptible to even the smallest changes in pH or stuff like that. So goldfish are generally good for aquaponic systems. Um, if we wanted to do, I know in larger aquaponic systems, they generally use koi or tilapia just because koi are, you know, they're big, they sell well, and tilapia they make food out of and they, they poop a lot. So it's good for the, the, the plants. But since our systems are small scale, goldfish are like the next best option. We wanted to try shrimp too, but it, 
uh, timing wise didn't work out. Was the idea that they would if you did do tilapia, that that would be a resource as well. Like yeah. 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 That that would be the best option, but it's just so big, and so it wouldn't be able to fit on something like an ISS. But I mean, if they if they have something like if they're doing this on the moon or something like that, they could potentially have room for that. Mm -hmm. So okay, one more, going back to the minerals use, <laughs> it would be really cool if you could get somebody to give you some moon dust. <laughs> because like if that works really well as an absorbent, that'd be perfect. That'd be good for people on the moon. No, it, and that's also I, I was looking into that in the beginning. I, I was excited about this stuff uh, in the beginning, and I was looking into <laughs> yeah, no, not not anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> I was looking into possibly like what the rocks are made of on Mars and stuff like that. And I wasn't, I mean, they, they've taken them back and stuff like that, but I wasn't really finding any relation between that and something that would be a good absorbent. Yeah. Like I was trying to find connections, but they just weren't there. Yeah. Um, but it's a cool idea. Yeah. Activated carbon. I'm thinking about Mars rocks maybe working or not working, but with your activated carbon not working, is it? I'm not, is it a function of the, I'm wondering if it's like a pH or pH function in the sense that I know with our biochar, it's not activated carbon, but we've done biochar on activated carbon, it has a really high pH. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the issue with the ammonia, also, you know, we get ammonia volatilization if the pH is high, so when they combine, we mm -hmm. get volatilization. So we've actually done chambers to like see the amount of volatilization because when it interacts, it's like, it just goes away, it doesn't absorb. Exactly. So I'm wondering if there's, at least with the activated carbon, if there might be a kind of pH volatilization factor going on. Yeah, and so that was when I originally started doing the research, I put the activated carbon in a flask with the ammonia, and I was like, oh, it, went all, it all went away, this is great. But the pH was at 11. Um, <laughs> and so, it, it, you know. And then you were really a little faint. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so. <laughs> we uh that's why we're treating it with like hydrogen peroxide and stuff like that because it helps keep the the you know it, it makes it so that it doesn't bring the ph as high but it's still hard to control things like activated carbon so that i think that's mostly why it's causing a problem on the absorption side the zeolite isn't it more like certain what was it it's the pH? It, it keeps it around seven yeah. like maybe closer to eight so we want it to be a little lower but after we treated it with the sodium it was perfect um yeah any other questions for jonas well, thank you very much for a very interesting seminar. Of course, thank you.